Well, once again, good morning. Uh, I've really, I've had a blast this week, and I've enjoyed the conversations that I've had with many of you in, in the breaks and various times during the week. I think it has been 35 to 40 years since I've been around a group of sojourners. Now, in the intervening years, I've encountered sojourners, different, just individuals, uh, different places, and have been able to speak to them about their ministries and about their trips. But as far as being around a, a large group of sojourners, it's been about that many years, and, and the faces have changed. But the mission and the dedication have remained the same, and that's really encouraging to see that this uh, uh, this ministry really has legs to it. It, it just it keeps going, and and uh, who knows, maybe 15 or 20 years, my wife and I will be sojourners. And uh, so I really appreciate appreciate the mission, absolutely. Um, we, we've spent this week, uh, and you've spent the last couple weeks, not just studying from the Bible, but talking about the Bible. And the first lesson in this series was about the divine inspiration and also the practical usefulness uh, of the Bible. The last two lessons, last two days, we focused on the, the nature of Scripture, that it primarily comes to us in narrative form. It's telling a story, and, and we've uh, outlined that large overarching story of the Bible. But, but this lesson might be the most important one in the series, because today we're talking about taking the words of the Bible, the words of Scripture, and applying these words to our lives. You know, access to the Bible isn't a problem. I should rephrase that. For us, access to the Bible isn't a problem. Uh, some places in the world it is a problem. But for us in, in this country, in the United States, 20 million Bibles are sold each year. That's a lot. Uh, in a single day, more than 168,000 Bibles are sold or given to others. Gideon's International that's the book that puts the Bibles in the, the hotel rooms. They distributed almost 60 million Bibles worldwide, many of those in this country last year. 92% uh, of Americans own at least one copy of the Bible. Now, that's a slightly higher percentage than the number of Americans who own vehicles. And, and I know vehicles are very expensive, but vehicles are thought to be a necessity to modern life. But you're a little bit more likely to know someone who doesn't own a vehicle than you are to know someone who doesn't own a Bible. And so most people own Bibles, and most of us don't just own one or two copies of the Bible, do we? Uh, I did a quick inventory uh, as I was preparing these lessons in my office, and I counted on my shelf 18 Bibles. And I know that I had some other ones that were tucked away in other locations that I really didn't hunt for, several others at home. So I would estimate I probably have about 25 Bibles. Now, I'm a preacher, so you would expect me to perhaps have more Bibles than the average person. But I, I know that we have a lot of Bibles, and I'm glad that we have such great access to Scripture. But here's the real question. Is all that access making a difference in our lives and the lives of others? Uh, the fact that we have the Bible, do, do we, uh, is that causing us to reorder and reprioritize our, our lives? Does it change the way that we treat others? And turn your Bibles to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, this, this is going to be our primary text this morning, we're going to start in verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, this is James 1, 19. Take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent. And humbly accept the word planted in you that could save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom continues in this, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. And then he talks about pure and, and faultless religion. But, but James has some, some things to say about doing the word of God, about applying the word of God. He says, humbly accept the word planted in you that can save you. That's verse 21. He says, do what it says, verse 22. He says, look intently into it, verse 25. He says, don't forget what you've heard, but do it, also verse 25. A number of years ago, there was a, a book published entitled The Year of Living Biblically, One Man's Humble Quest to Follow the Bible as Literally as Possible. 
Now, this was written by a man named A.J. Jacobs, who is not a believer, who's agnostic. Uh, he's Jewish, but he's not really a pra- he doesn't really practice the tenets of Judaism. He has a great line about that. He says, I'm Jewish in the same sense that the Olive Garden is Italian. Uh, in, other words, not ve- not, in other words, not very. But he wrote this book, kind of a tongue-in-cheek book, and I think in response to what he perceived as religious fundamentalism around him, but for an entire year, he tried to follow every command in the Bible as literally as he possibly could, Uh, even the obscure commands. And so not wearing clothes with mixed fibers, he didn't do that. Uh, He didn't boil a baby goat in its mother's milk. Now, he probably wouldn't have done that one anyway. But there were some other things that he really had to commit to. He said the command to be fruitful and multiply. He said he and his wife had twins the year he was researching for the book. He said there were some things that were kind of problematic, like stoning and adulterer. But he said he went through a public park with a pocket full of pebbles, just trying to overhear conversations so he could just pelt any potential violators. So he re- you've got to give it to him. He really went out all out to try to keep every command in the Bible as literally as possible. Well, when he finished the project, he had a New York Times bestseller, but he was no closer to God. And author John Ortberg, I think, hit the nail on the head when he reviewed this book. He said this. Oh, sorry. He said this. It's a humorous book, but it's, he is dead wrong. He missed the whole point of the Bible. If you treat the Bible naively as a list of disconnected rules, as though it were an owner's manual, you are not taking the Bible literally. You have to know the whole story. The whole story of, of Scripture. And, and that's what we've spent, that's why we've spent the last couple of days telling the story of the Bible, because the, the big story of the Bible helps us to better understand uh, which commands are for us and which for, were for ancient Israel, uh, how to know if something in the Bible is descriptive, just describing the way that something was done at a certain time in a certain place, and what is prescriptive, what is for all believers in, in all times. And so it could be challenging to apply the Bible as we should and even to know at times what to apply. But I believe James, here in James chapter 1, gives us some prerequisites for applying the Bible well. And here's the first prerequisite. Uh, You must be His. To really be changed, shaped, transformed by the Bible. And I believe this is where A.J. Jacobs went wrong. Uh, We must belong to Him. And so... James is addressing his readers, he addresses them in verse 19 as brothers and sisters. He he says the word has been planted in them, verse 21. So it hasn't just been in one ear, out the other, but it has really taken root in their lives. James is addressing Christian people. Now, understand, there is a sense in which the Bible is for everyone. It's for saints and sinners, it's for believers and unbelievers. And we could probably recall some, some passages that come to mind. Uh, here's one from John chapter 20. Jesus performed many si- other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and so that by believing you might have life in his name. And so John says the stated purpose of his, him writing his gospel is so that those who don't believe might come to believe because of the words that he has written. And so the Bible does have power to convict sinners Uh, to speak to those who who aren't currently uh, believers in Christ. Uh, Romans chapter 10, here's another. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe on the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? What are they preaching? They're preaching the Bible. How can anyone preach unless they're sent? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard from the word of Christ. And so most likely you are a Christian right now because someone cared enough to study the Bible with you. And so you weren't a believer, someone opened up scripture with you, you were convicted by it, you became a believer, you became a Christian, you were baptized. Um, Personally, I'm amazed at the power that scripture has in and of itself to do this, to to lead people to faith, to change hearts and lives. When when we were missionaries in South America, we spent five years in in the country of, of Chile, and uh, I struggled the entire time. I don't, do not have a natural aptitude for languages and uh, could never lose my Texas accent, even speaking Spanish. Uh, but I remember the first Bible study that I conducted in Spanish, personal Bible, evangelistic Bible study. And uh, I was still, my Spanish was so shaky. And essentially all I could do was just read the study. I couldn't answer very well complex questions. If he asked me a question, I really struggled. I could understand the question really struggled to, 
to answer, not because I didn't know the answer, but just because it was hard to articulate uh, the answer to the question. And no one was more surprised than I was when we got to that decision point, asked if he, what was preventing him from being baptized, and he said he wanted to be baptized. Well, that's one of those occasions when I know that it wasn't my articulate words that converted him. Uh, it wasn't my ability to communicate that led him to Christ. It was the fact that we had been in the Word of God and these words were the words that had convicted him uh, of his sin and, and uh, led him to that decision. So, so that's very legitimate. That's very real. But there's another sense in which uh, we grow in the deeper truths of scriptures when we belong to the Lord. So uh, a couple of scriptures here. Uh, the Advocate, the Holy Father, who, uh, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. It's the word spoken to the apostles. Uh, the person without the Spirit of God does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Now, uh, just a disclaimer, I understand that some of these words are spoken specifically to the apostles, okay? So I don't believe in the what some call the doctrine of illumination, that the Holy Spirit's going to give us truths that, that aren't in the Bible. But I do believe that the Spirit's help in our lives is across the board. That when we have the Holy Spirit, that he's helping us to, to make sense of things that we read, God's truths, that he's helping us. Romans chapter 8 says he helps us in our weaknesses. And of course, he gives the example there of, of helping us in, in prayer. And so I do believe when we belong to God, that's when we really grow and begin to understand uh, better his revelation to us. There were some in Corinth that resisted Paul's apostolic preaching and teaching authority. And Paul exposes them, says they're natural men without the spirit. And so there's an, an inevitability to their rejection of Paul's ideas. They can't understand because they lack an essential element which is the Holy Spirit living in their lives. Uh, you have to be spiritually alive to have a spiritual appetite. And it's the same way you have to be naturally alive to have a physical appetite. Uh, a corpse doesn't say, I sure could you go for a steak and potatoes right now. And you have to be physically alive to have a natural appetite. You have to be spiritually alive to have a spiritual appetite. And the Spirit gives life, Jesus said, John 6, 63. And Paul taught the same truth in Romans 8. And so that's the first prerequisite for applying the Word of God is you have to be His. Here's the second. Uh, you have to be hungry. Uh, Jesus said, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. I, I was having a conversation with uh, Dirk Smith, who's the, uh, or at least was, maybe, I don't know if he still is, but the vice president of Eastern European Missions. Do any of you know Dirk or know of Eastern European Missions, perhaps? Um, and so they distribute, if, you, if you're not familiar with their ministry, they distribute Bibles uh, to over 30 nations, 20 different languages. So I guess that would be more than just Eastern Europe, but their focus is, is Eastern Europe. And so he said occasionally he'll travel back through the countries where they've distributed Bibles. So Ukraine, Romania, Poland, some of those nations. He says whenever he goes back and whenever he converses with someone who's received one of their Bibles, he says he always asks the same two questions. He says the first question is, have you read it? He said the answer is always, always yes. He says, the second question he asked is, how long did it take you to read it? And I can't remember exactly what he told I think he said a month. May have been less than that. Now, that's convicting to me because when the calendar turns to January, how many of us say, okay, I'm going to read through my entire Bible this year? And then we give up in Leviticus or March, whichever comes first. <laughs> and so these people, they receive Bibles in one month. They read from Genesis to Revelation because there's such a hunger for the Word of God. Now, they just can't get enough of it. And so there are still people out there that have that level of hunger for Scripture. And, and I wish we could reclaim some of that in, in our lives and arouse some of that because I think we've lost much of it. And, and we can speculate as to some of the reasons why we've lost some of that hunger. We, we live in a very entertainment-saturated culture. And so we have endless options for streaming and watching and viewing and listening and uh, it's a digital age. We've kind of become conditioned to, uh, to consume truth in 140 character sound bites or 280 characters, whatever it is on social media now. Uh, frankly, I think at times the misuse of the Bible has decreased, suppressed our appetite for the Son of God or, or for the Word of God. 
because uh, we've been taught an approach to the Bible that the Bible is just a repository of facts to be uh, extracted and cataloged and arranged into doctrines. And sometimes that could be a pretty lifeless approach if we're not keeping it in the context of the big story, the compelling story that, that the Bible is telling. Sometimes we lose, uh, we don't see the, the, the forest for the trees. But for whatever reason we want, it is, we want to reclaim that, that hunger just like someone living in Romania has when they receive their first Bible. And they just can't wait to open up. They can't wait to read it. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 says, Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. How many of you have been around a hungry baby? A grandbaby or a great-grandbaby? They let you know when they're hungry, don't they? It's been a long time since we've had a baby in the house, but we've got a puppy in the house right now, a black lab, a year old, and he lets us know when he's hungry. Uh, he groans and moans and just plops down right beside his food, empty food bowl, and that's kind of his cue. Hey, it's time to, it's time to feed me here. Well, in our text, James says that we are to look intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. And that Greek word literally means to stoop down and look at something, to bend forward to examine something. Uh, our family vacationed uh, early this summer in the Smoky Mountains in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and on our last day, we drove through. Some of you have been to Cades Cove, which is part of a Smoky Mountain National Park, and we drove through hoping to see some wildlife, and cars were stopped ahead of us, and so we knew that meant that they were looking at something, so we stopped behind them and walked up, and, and uh, everybody was way too close, but there were some black bears there, and, and everyone was looking at those black bears, and some people were stooping down with their cameras to get a good shot, and some people that were back behind other people were leaning in to see, and that's the sense, that look intently into the word. It's that our posture changes because we're, we're looking at something so closely, examining something so closely. There's a hunger to see what's there. And so we have to be his, we have to be hungry, and then the third prerequisite is you have to be humble. Now notice again the, the phrase at the end of James 1.21, humbly accept the word planted in you. I think maybe the best approach we could uh, have to, to Bible reading and Bible study is what Samuel did in 1 Samuel chapter 3 when the Lord was calling him. And so three times the Lord calls out to Samuel, and Samuel thinks it's Eli who's calling. So he goes in to Eli, and Eli finally the third time, Eli realizes what must be going on and advises Samuel to answer back and say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Well, that's a great mantra for us. That, that would be a great prayer to, to pray each time before you open your Bible. Just to say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Now, what is it that you have to say? What truth do you have to impart to me? What is it that you want me to do? Speak, speak Lord, uh, for your servant is listening. That's a humble posture. I'm the servant, you're the master. I'm all ears. You just tell me what you want to tell me. And it's remarkable to me that we could take something as humbling as receiving God's revelation, our, commu our, our creator communicating to us that we could take something like that and be prideful about it. Yet, unfortunately, that is all too often is the case. Now, people could become intoxicated by Bible knowledge. It's almost like we get drunk on the Bible. So J.I. Packer said this. He said, if we pursue theological knowledge for its own sake, one more slide here. If we pursue theological knowledge for its own sake, it's bound to go bad on us. Now, obviously, the Pharisees fell into this trap. We saw the verse yesterday where Jesus said, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, and yet you refuse to come to me to have life. On another occasion, Jesus said, everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. And so the phylacteries, these were these leather, leather boxes that they would wear on their hands or on their foreheads, uh, with, attached with leather straps, and those boxes would have scripture in them. They would be scriptures from, uh, from Exodus or from Deuteronomy, mostly the, the verses that talk about binding the law to one's mind, and so they could literally say that scripture was always on their mind because they were wearing those phylacteries, and that was their favorite fashion accessory, because it showed how spiritual they were. And Jesus calls them out on that. Uh, when I was uh, first in, in graduate school, started out in, in graduate school, the very first book that was assigned to us was 
was uh, this little book. It's entitled A Little Exercise for Young Theologians. It was written by a German theologian. I don't know what year it was written. It was translated into English in 1962. But the basic message of the book was this. As you start in Bible college, you start towards this advanced degree, your Bible knowledge is going to soar. But you need to be careful with that. Because that could go to your head very, very quickly. Increased Bible knowledge is not the same as increased spirituality. And it's not necessarily the ticket to a healthy relationship with God. And so don't neglect your prayer life in this. Don't forget those humble acts of service such as what Jesus did in his ministry. And don't think that your knowledge makes you any greater or more superior in the kingdom of God. And so in our first lesson in, in this series on, on Monday when we were in 2 Timothy chapter 3, remember that, that, that passage about the inspiration, the application of, of scripture. There was also a description there of the false teachers in Ephesus. And Paul described them this way. He said, they're always learning, but they're never coming to a knowledge of the truth. They're always learning but they're never coming to a knowledge of truth. And that, that's what can happen if we don't approach the Bible with humility. And so those are the prerequisites for applying Scripture. You must be His, you must be hungry, you must be humble. And if we meet those prerequisites, then we can be doers of the Word. Not just hearers of the Word, we can be doers of the Word. And so doers of the Word aim for heart-level change. And, and so this text in James uh, speaks... Uh, issue. It starts with anger. Uh, James, when James speaks of the moral filth that he speaks of there in, in verse 21, uh, he is just given the example of, of anger. And we're living in a very angry society right now, aren't we? And you see that on the highways with aggressive drivers and road rage and middle fingers. And we see it in the workplace with irate bosses and uh, irate customers. Uh, we see it in, on the news with violent protests and angry mobs. I mean, it's all around us, and to the point that we start to absorb some of that, and we find ourselves becoming more easily angered, don't we? And so James shares this proverb. He says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And so there's some evidence that this was a Jewish proverb that was already floating around, but he, James Christianizes it, and the uh, book of Proverbs says some things very similar to this. But the real solution to that anger is verse 21. He says, humbly accept the word planted in you that could save you. Anger is a heart issue, and the Bible is a book that speaks to the heart, that connects us to the heart of the lawgiver. And I love that phrase, the word planted in us. And there's a New Testament parallel to this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, where he says, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living, enduring word of God. And so when the word is planted in us, when that imperishable seed is in us, it grows and it can't help but change our behavior. And so what happens is our anger is changed to patience and our pride becomes humility and our dishonesty leads to honesty and selfishness results and turns instead to, to sacrifice and being sacrificial people. Jesus also used the same illustration, uh, analogy of the word of God being like seed. And so that's the parable of the sower. I think several have referenced that in some of our, the messages that have been presented this week. A farmer goes out to sow seed, and uh, not all the seed takes root and continues to grow. And so some of the seed snatched up, some falls on the shallow soil, some is scorched by the sun. But then we read, still others fell on good soil where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. Uh, I mentioned in one of the lessons that some things in the Bible are descriptive and some things are prescriptive. Here, here's an error I think we've made with this passage, the parable of the sower. I think we've understood this as descriptive, but I'm not so sure it is. I think it's prescriptive. In other words, I think we've said, okay, you know, the seed falls on this soil and some of it's going to get snatched up and some of it's going to get choked out and that's just the way it is. There's nothing we can do about that. I think this is prescriptive though. I think this is telling us you need to be good soil. Don't allow the seed that's been sown in your life to get snatched up. Don't allow the seed that's been sown in your life to get choked out. Uh, you be good soil. So it's telling us what, not just describing what is, it's telling us what we should be and what we should do and how we should receive the word of God that's been planted in us. Just like it said in, there in our passage in James, humbly accept the word planted in you, which could save you. And so second truth about doers of the word is that doers of the word avoid self-deception. 
Do not merely listen to the word, do what it says. And so being a doer of the word, this was taught by Judaism and it was taught by Jesus. Uh, in Exodus 24, when Moses told the people all of the Lord's words, they responded with one voice and they said, what the Lord has said, we will do. That's what they said, what the Lord has said, we will do. And Jesus continued that tradition. He said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. He's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Uh, listening and doing have always been connected. And when we, uh, when we leave out the ladder, we're deceiving ourselves. Uh, years ago, the Prince of Granada was sentenced to solitary confinement in one of Madrid's ancient prisons. And during his entire imprisonment, over 30 years, he was given one book to read, the Bible. And uh, he did read it. He read it hundreds of times with painstaking care. And, and you would think that anyone who read the Bible that much would surely, surely be changed by it. Well, he died after 33 years in prison, and when, as the authorities went through uh, his cell, they found these words etched on the walls of his cell. The 8th verse in the 97th Psalm is the middle verse of the Bible. Ezra chapter 7 verse 21 contains all the letters of the alphabet except the letter J. Esther 8 9 is the longest verse in the Bible. John eleven thirty five 35 is the shortest verse in the Bible. No word or name of more than six syllables can be found in the Bible. 33 years alone with the Bible, and all he got out of it was Bible trivia. Because he was a listener, he wasn't a doer. Uh, he didn't allow it to penetrate his heart. Doers of the word uh, finally accept the truth about themselves. And so it's not just the propositional truths of Scripture, that's a part of it, but the truth about ourselves and our fallen condition. And, and the way that James says this is he gives the analogy of a mirror. He says anyone who listens to the word of God does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. And so when we look at a mirror, we're looking at ourselves. So this point should be uh, obvious, uh, should be an obvious and important point that we need to seek to apply the Bible first to ourselves. And so often we want to apply the Bible to everyone but ourselves, don't we? And so on occasion, someone will come up to me and say, Keith, uh, you need to preach on this or that particular sin. Uh, we're not hearing enough about this. We need to hear it. It needs to come from the pulpit. And, and I appreciate the, the, the intent behind that. There are things that our people need to, to hear. And I certainly believe that uh, I believe in preaching grace, but you can't understand grace if you don't understand sin. So we have to preach about sin. But never in 25 years of ministry, see what's curious is that the suggested topics are never issues or problems for the people that are suggesting them. And so in 25 years of ministry, 25 plus years of ministry, never have I had someone come to me and say, uh, Keith, I really wish you would preach a sermon about pride because I'm really struggling with that in my life. Or Keith, could you preach a sermon about anger because I'm really wrestling with these angry outbursts and I know I need to be convicted by the word of God. And so it's, we want to preach about sin, but we just don't want to preach about our sins. <laughs> we want to hear about sin, we just don't want to hear about our sins. We want to talk about and hear about someone else's sin. And James's analogy is the word of God is like a mirror. It's not like a group photo. It's not a group photo where you go and you look at how everyone else looks. It, it's a mirror that reflects back who you are and who you should be and God's will for your life. And so when I stand in front of a mirror, there's always something that needs to change. Uh, there's a hair out of place or something stuck between my teeth or whatever it is. And so I would be foolish to look in a mirror and not change whatever it is that needs to be changed. And then I did have one more point, sorry. Uh, when we apply, when we are doers of the word of God, we are blessed. We are blessed. And so verse 25, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in this, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Uh, it's interesting that the Bible, describe, the Bible is described as the perfect law that brings freedom. And so James uses a similar phrase, the, the law that brings freedom, that's in chapter 2, verse 12, excludes the word perfect there, but basically the same phrase is in chapter 1. He also, in chapter 2, verse 8, mentions the royal law, which he defines as love your neighbor as yourself, part of the greatest commands. We typically, though, don't associate laws with liberty. When we read about a law that gives freedom, that's not usually the association that we make. Usually when we think about law, someone said law has two purposes, to keep me from doing what I want to do and force me to do what I don't want to do. And that's what law is. But James says God's law, when it's kept and when it's carried out, will bless your life in immeasurable ways. And it's meant to be a blessing and not a burden. 
And it was always meant to be that. Even the law of Moses was meant to be that. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 40 says, Keep his decrees and commands which I am giving you today so that it may go well with you. So that you may live in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Of course, things started to go sideways when people disconnected the law from the lawgiver. And they started viewing the law just as author A.J. Jacobs did as a set of disconnected rules rather than part of a much larger story of God's redemptive activity in this world and through his people. And so many of Jesus' showdowns, so many of Jesus' conflicts with the Pharisees were over alleged violations of Sabbath law. And, so, and that's because they had taken something that was intended to be a blessing and had made it a burden. And Jesus corrected that by saying, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. But the blessings will come not just by hearing it, by doing it. Keep his decrees and commands, Moses said. Don't just be hearers, be doers, says James. Jesus told a story to illustrate this. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Oh, did I go too far? Yeah. Yeah, that second passage there. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, everyone who's a hearer and a doer is like a man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Uh, We're living in one of the most challenging times I can remember in my lifetime. And you've lived longer than I have, so it may be one of the most challenging times you remember in your lifetime. But we've been through a global pandemic, Uh, challenging economic times, lots of political division, racial tensions. The rains are coming down. The winds are blowing. Is our house going to remain standing? And the difference will be, is our foundation on biblical truth? Is our foundation based on, on the word of God? That's the only strong, solid, sure foundation. And my hope is that these lessons have helped us to strengthen and build that foundation there's no other book like the bible it's not just another book it's not just an important book Uh, we believe it's the book we don't just read it we feast on it Uh, it's what shapes our worldview it's what informs our actions philosopher emile calais was born in a small french village this is the end of the 19th century Uh, he was educated as a naturalist he didn't have much room for for god or the bible and his thinking uh, his philosophical beliefs didn't serve him very well when he fought in the front lines of World War I. Uh, he saw many of his friends die right in front of him. He himself was wounded. That caused him to be removed from the battlefield and, and uh, went through a period of, of rehab, turned his world upside down. He, he went through, a, 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 had trouble finding meaning in his life. And he wrote these words during that time. He said, during long watches in the foxhole, I've been longing, as strange as it might sound, for a book that would understand me. But I knew of no such book. Now I would, in secret, prepare one for my own private use. As I would read, I would file passages that spoke to my condition. Then copy them in a leather-bound book that I would always carry with me. Now, at this point in his life, Emil Calais had never seen a copy of the Bible. But after the war, he sat down with his anthology, these passages that he had collected from other sources and from poems and from writings and from philosophical uh, uh, writings. And he, would re- he read what he had put together for himself. But all the passages that he spoke, that he thought spoke to his condition, just reminded him of their context. They reminded him of war and of pain and of sadness and of loneliness. And he realized this book that he had put together didn't have any power. Well, it just so happened that same day, Calais' wife came into possession of a Bible. In Mill Calais' household, they had always vowed that religious, religion would be a taboo subject. But at the end, a disappointing day when he found such disappointment reading the writings that he had collected, he took the Bible that his wife had acquired, took it to his study, started to read, read from the Beatitudes. And as he read, he discovered that this was the book that he had always been looking for. This was the book that understood him. And so after he read for the better part of the night, mostly in the Gospels, here's what he said about that experience. And lo and behold, as I looked through them, the one of whom they spoke became alive in me. See, that's our hope when we read the Bible. That the hero of the story, the one to whom Scripture testifies, becomes alive in us. That's the true intent of the Bible. I I know he's alive in you. I've seen it in your love and your hospitality throughout the week. I see it certainly in your mission and your purpose and soul journey. 
And so thank you for allowing me to be with you, and, and God bless you in your, in your mission.